Uh, and the SX4 and the Vitara. Um, it's an 80 uh, amp alternator at 12 volts, so in and around 1,000 watts-ish. Um, this is actually a lot to consider. So I'm gonna have a couple of notes, and that's exactly what they are, is notes. And I don't mean to insult anybody's intelligence, but let's just consider the simplest of generators before we even get started. And I'm gonna have a couple of notes as we move through this program. And they're no designed to insult anybody's intelligence. They're just to make sure we have at least a baseline understanding. What do we need to actually have a generator, right? We need a, a coil wire. We need to induce a magnetic field that cuts across that coil of wire uh, in order to have a generator of any sorts, right? And we're talking about AC here, of course. Appreciate DC. Um, different different kettle of fish we'll get to that the alternator does of course produce dc but it does so through rectification but we'll get to that in due course so again back to our basic drawing here we have a uh, a permanent magnet right just a horseshoe magnet type arrangement although it's just showed like this for for uh, simplification we rotate that permanent magnet providing a field that cuts across the coils of wire uh, we have an iron core in there a as an intensifier type thing let's call it and uh, what we do is when we rotate that we can actually generate a small ac uh, uh, voltage across the pins a and b here right so how could we actually control this right we could sp spin the the little magnet faster and that would be one way that we could actually produce more power from the simple little gen gen set here right and there's a couple of ways we can actually um alter the amount of power that this simple generator can power can uh, can generate Speed is one of them, as we just uh, mentioned, the, the speed of rotation. Uh, the strength of the magnetic field, we could get a bigger permanent magnet, right? Now there would cr clearly be limitations uh, uh, in that regard, right? Or the number of turns, we could up the number of turns in the coil of wire here as well. Uh, the more coils, the more amount of, uh, the higher the capacity of the, the generator. Again, no practical way of altering anything. This is, there's a couple of different ways we could actually control this though. Can you appreciate that we're just looking at a, a basic permanent magnet here for the sake of simplicity, but just disregard the, the permanent magnet here for a second. And if we just consider this coil of wire with a, with a iron core, if we actually ran a, a current through this, that would actually act as an electromagnet, essentially giving us a north and a south pole the same way this does, right? So. Now we're actually talking about a practical means of controlling the amount of strength of the magnetic field. So obviously we'd have considerably more complicated setup with respect to how would we spin this and keep it in contact with its power source. Well, we'd need a slip ring arrangement, brushes and slip rings, and that's exactly what we have. So I think that's enough to actually take us to the real world cross section here of the alternator. So we have the, obviously we have the housing of the alternator itself, and that's fine, that's a given, right? Uh, we have the drive coming in through the serpentine belt, through the pulley here, that comes across on the shaft. On that shaft, as it spins, you can see here in blue, is actually shown the field coil. It's a coil of wire, right? Which is fed a voltage at varying um, intensities, shall we say, at varying voltage levels in order to control the amount of output that this alternator can actually generate, right? In order to do so, um, as I said, we've got a slip ring arrangement here where the field coil um, current is actually applied to the, uh, to the field coil. And we have some pole pieces that I've shown here, showing the north and south arrangement. This is a this is a factory drawing, of course. I've altered it a wee bit for my own purposes here, guys. But they kind of interlace like your fingers if you were to hold them like this. Why do they do that? If you just had a coil, you'd end up with a south pole and a north pole set up to the left and right of the the center line of the the windings, and that really wouldn't do as much good with respect to generation. So, so to make it practical, to have alternating north and south in order to maximize the efficiency of the rig. Um, we have the, the pole pieces that actually set up the magnetic field in the manner shown in the drawing here. Uh, the stator windings are radially uh, mounted around the field coil and they're wound in a pretty complicated manner, but there's three phases essentially that the, uh, the field coil 
uh, magnetic field, rotates, cuts the uh, stator windings, and induces power into the uh, into the system. It's a three phase system. Those three phases are actually fed to a diode network because alternating alternating uh, uh, power, alternating voltage and current doesn't do us any good in an automotive application. Obviously, it has a 12 volt battery. After all, we're looking for DC uh, voltage. So in order to facilitate that, we have a network of diodes that we'll see on the drawing, and it actually rectifies the three-phase power. But keep in mind, the field winding is the one that's basically doing all the real controlling here. There is a regulator here in order to regulate the amount of current that's supplied um, to the field coil in order to control the degree of generation via the uh, stator coils. So the regulator is what we're actually interested in here and appreciate that in this setup in most modern cars in fact this regulator is actually duty cycle controlled via the engine control module we'll take a look at the uh, the schematic and we'll see if we can make some sense of that but before we do let's take a look at some basics with respect to duty cycle control and a wee bit of solid state electronics don't don't panic Simplest the simple. It'd be nice if we understand what we're talking about here with respect to duty cycle. We also have to define whether this is high side switched or ground side switched. There's two ways to turn on a light bulb. We can have a hard ground and have a switched uh, power supply, or we can have hard wired power supply with a switched ground. So if we had 12 volts on a light on uh, the input side of a light bulb and we had, let's say, 12 volts on the output side, would we have any output with respect to the light bulb? Would there be any illumination? No, we wouldn't have any with respect to ground side switch. If we had a light bulb that was hardwired uh, with uh, 12 volts on one side and our controlling element was ground side switched and it was down at ground, we'd have 100% output of the light bulb, whatever wattage that would actually be, arbitrary wattage for, for the sake of our explanation so can you appreciate that if we have duty cycle control that is to say that we can switch between these two modes of operation and yeah this is my hokey uh, example of 50 percent but appreciate the high and the lows are actually equal guys that we'd have the light bulb illuminating at half intensity if our switching was applied if we had 12 volts applied to the light bulb and then our switching was at 50% on the low side, can you imagine that we would have, if it was a 10 watt light bulb, we'd have five watts of output with this degree of control on the ground side. Does that make sense? I think that makes good sense. And can you appreciate that if we varied it anywhere in between here, that we could actually have from the off to the fully bright position, any degree of control in between. This is the beauty of duty cycle control. Okay, enough said about duty cycle. A lot of boring math later. There is a solid state switch, namely a transistor in our schematic that we're gonna see that you're gonna have to uh, appreciate how it actually turns on and turns off. But I'm not gonna try to give you an electronics 101 course in the space of uh, 30 seconds. But we do need to know the, uh, the uh, different states and uh, the different uh, um, modes of operation of the same transistor, right? So it's an NPN type transistor that you'll see in the uh, drawing. How do we know that? Because the emitter is not pointing towards the base. That's how we know it, it with respect to its configuration. So how do we actually control the on and the off state of this said transistor, which is acting just as a solid state switch in the uh, schematic. So this is our setup. We have the collector, the emitter, and the base. The base in our drawing has a 12 volt supply all the time through the field coil, you'll see it on the uh, schematic, and it has a hard ground on the emitter, hence the common emitter terminology. The emitter is going to ground, common. So the controlling element must be the base. So in order to, for this to conduct, guys, what we need is a negative, which we have with a hard ground, a positive and most positive scenario applied to the base to the entire uh, configuration in fact, but the control element is the base if we have two fixed, if we have a fixed voltage here and a fixed ground here, then simply by toggling the base 
between positive, we'll turn the, uh, the switch on or close the switch between the collector and the emitter. And if we have a negative near ground, we'll simply turn the switch off or open circuit the uh, system between the collector and the emitter. Uh, so here's our uh, schematic. What do we actually have in the schematic? We have the alternator itself, item one, all within the uh, housing. Um, we have the ignition switch and the warning light on the dash, of course. Uh, we have the engine control module. The engine control module is looking at um, the demands on the electrical network and actually putting out a pulse train on the uh, control line. Um, the, uh, so there'll be a pulse train on the control line here. It's applied to contact C on the connector and goes into the regulator assembly. I've taken a Weva a license on the um, on a schematic here, boys, and added uh, the inverter circuit there, just in the interest of um, understanding what's actually happening. It's only there on a conceptual level. Why did I add it? Because the drawing actually just leaves the control circuit going off in the space inside the regulator, as well as the uh, the transistor. Um, the NPN type transistor um, just floating in space here the base going off into God knows where but if you just uh, picture an inverter um, between the two lines here this is going to work for us from a, from a concept standpoint so the pulse train actually comes in as I said this is a ground side switch arrangement so and with this configuration of the transistor we have to have that inverter because uh, what does the inverter actually do? It takes this signal and inverts it, as you might well imagine. So as the uh, the pulse actually comes in, uh, again, guys, uh, low is the active state on this. So the low actually comes in, is inverted to a high. That high is actually applied to the, the uh, base of the transistor here. And as we spoke of earlier, how do we try and turn this transistor on? We have a negative with a hard ground. We now have a positive through the inverter action here on the pulse train. And we have, you'll notice there's a positive. If you go to the field coil, all the way around, it comes back to the battery uh, positive. So now we have the conditions uh, that we require in order to turn the transistor on. A negative, a positive, and a most positive. So the current is actually applied through the field coil. The field coil sets up the magnetic field, sorry, sets up the magnetic field as it's rotating, of course, through the uh, the poles. Uh, the poles will actually induce the uh, um, voltage, the current, and uh, the, uh, the windings of the stators. The three phases of the uh, stators will actually apply that um, AC signal. AC is no, no good to us for automotive applications, of course. That AC signal is then applied to the, the diode network here. The diode network will rectify that three-phase AC into pulsing DC, which is applied to the rest of the electrical network for us. In addition to the control line, which is controlling the switch in action, or the degree, uh, the intensity, if you will, of the field coil, uh, we also have a feedback mechanism here that actually uh, tells the uh, ECM whether the uh, alternator and the rest of the system is actually following the command on the control line. So my furnace is about to start, boys. I'll uh, cut it off and I'll leave it at that. Hopefully that all makes sense.